Hello and welcome to all of you here today for uh, this April uh, Architreats lecture. Um, I have my cell phone here, just to remind me to turn it off, and uh, I hope all of you uh, will join me in doing that. Um, and um, I, I, Sherry Hamill, as most of you know, who are regulars here, normally introduce introduces each speaker, but I asked her today if I could introduce Mills because I, I th Mills was the, f the first person that I met when I came here uh, as a historian, uh, the first historian I met when I came here 27 years ago this summer, and, and Mills' work has had such an important impact on my understanding of Alabama history, and also I feel that uh, my I want to thank him for his personal friendship as well. And so I, the introduction is going to take a little bit longer than a, a, a usual introduction. Um, some of you may have known David Lewis, who was a longtime historian at Auburn, uh, wrote this wonderful history of Sloss Furnace. Um, David was over here doing research about 10 years ago on another project, and David told me that he had finished this book. It had been uh, accepted by the University of Alabama Press and was ready to go to the printers to be published. And then Leah Atkins said, David, have you looked at Mills Thornton's book, Politics and Power in a Slave Society, this book? And, um, and David read it, and he said, stop the presses. He went back, he pulled this, he rewrote the entire book because he realized that what he learned from Mills carried him to a whole deeper level of understanding, and he reworked this entire book uh, be, be, after reading Mills' work. Um, that's the kind of impact that Mills has had on everyone who's worked in Alabama history and on historians across the United States who teach history, teach Southern history or American history, who read his work and who use it and who have a kind of a fundamental a realignment of the way they see and understand history because of the work Mills has done. Uh, I've told people a number of times that I feel lucky to work in a state that has as its state historian Mills Thornton because almost every time I look at something and I read something or learn something by Mills, he carries it to a whole new level and, and he helps me see things in a whole new way. Now his book, Politics and Power in Slave Society, was uh, his first book. It was published in the 1970s. Uh, and it's work that he did under, you know, the great historian uh, of, of Southern history, C. Van Woodward, who was his dissertation professor at Yale. And, um, and, and Mills, this reflects years of research uh, on the subject that uh, he will talk to us about. It is a very, very dense book. Every word means something, every sentence means something, and, but it is, a, it is a revelation. It was the book that was the revelation to David Lewis. Uh, his most recent book is called Dividing Lines, and it's about um, the race, the civil rights movement in Montgomery and Selma and Birmingham, a comparison and an, an, an analysis. And it, like politics and power, is a dense and powerful insightful book, uh, 733 pages, and, and uh, every word counts. Uh, and and it, again, it, for those of you who read it or just read parts of it about your community or uh, things that you're interested in, I think it will help you see and appreciate uh, what's happened in Montgomery and in Alabama in the mid 20th century in a way that just kind of opens new, new fields of understanding. So um, for his years of friendship, for all he's done for the Department of Archives and History, for, uh, for what he's done for Alabama history and for American history, uh, I am deeply grateful and it is an honor and privilege for me to introduce uh, Mills Thornton. Thank you, Ed, for that uh, enormously gracious uh, introduction. I want to uh, talk to, to you today about the interconnection between the socioeconomic structure of antebellum Alabama and the state's political history. In a sense, 
For Alabama in the 19th century, geography was destiny. The division of the state by the essentially accidental disposition of the state's boundaries into regions in which the fertility of the soil and navigable river networks made market agriculture possible, the Black Belt and the Tennessee Valley, and regions in which rocky or sandy soil and lack of access to water transportation dictated semi-subsistence agriculture, the hill counties and the wiregrass, meant that two very different patterns of culture developed reflecting very different values. The defining feature of life in the yeoman farmer sections of the state was the presence of vast tracts of public domain. As late as 1850, only a decade before the Civil War, more than half of the entire land area of Alabama remained unowned by anybody. The vast majority of this public acreage was in the hill counties and the wiregrass. And the reason for this is clear, the minimum price per acre that the federal government could accept for it by law was simply greater than the land was worth. The result was that settlers in the yeoman areas generally purchased only small tracts immediately surrounding their cabins or purchased no land at all and simply squatted on the public land and used the vast public acreage to allow their livestock, principally pigs, to graze. The overwhelming bulk of yeoman property was in livestock. The pigs were cut with brands on their ears, the origin incidentally of the term earmarks, now chiefly used in reference to governmental budgets. <laughs> and then they were turned loose to fend for themselves in the forest until the annual roundups after the first frost in the late fall. This grazing economy was supported by the fencing laws of the southern and western states, which required that growing crops be fenced in to protect them from being eaten by roving livestock, with a fence that was, in the colorful words of the statutes, horse high, bull strong, and hog tight. Any unfenced land, whether privately owned or not, was open by law to grazing by wandering livestock and to hunting and fishing by anyone. This was a barter economy. Cash was necessary chiefly for dealing with government, such as paying taxes or buying public land. The necessities of families were made up by what in antebellum times was called exchange. Not only meat and foodstuffs were bartered, but labor, cloth, household goods, even the services of professionals such as doctors, lawyers, and ministers, and craftsmen such as blacksmiths and millers were generally paid for with goods or labor. And the credit accounts of the uh, country storekeeper were also settled with commodities. The storekeeper, indeed, was the link between the yeoman community and the market economy, accepting crops or meat to pay for store-bought goods and then selling them to factors and wholesalers in return for new stocks, new goods to stock his shelves. The yeoman areas were thus intensely, intensely interdependent communities with every family owing something to every neighbor and all depended on each other for survival. The community depended on trust of each other. It was therefore governed by gossip and doubts about the conformity of any member with community standards would mean his exclusion from the web of interdependence and his being compelled to move on to another area, usually farther west. The result was a reluctance to put down roots, to invest too much in any one place, a demand for westward expansion, an insistence on low taxes and limited government, and perhaps most ironically given the interdependence of the yeoman communities, a longing for independence and self-reliance 
to free oneself from the power of one's neighbors to control one's destiny. Liberty understood as individual autonomy was the primary value of the yeoman communities, and its twin value was equality. Equality as it appears in John Locke's second treatise, The Belief in Equal Rights for Every Citizen, was a founding value of the American Republic, of course, and had been enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. But the radical egalitarianism of the Jacksonians, the belief in the actual equality of citizens in capacities and talents, was something new and grew out of the experience of interdependence in the western and southern yeoman farming communities. It was this new faith in the wisdom of the common man that was the source of the efforts in the Alabama legislature to eliminate all examinations to practice medicine, law, and other professions, or to forbid the use of Latin phrases in the courts, and the denunciations of any marks of false social hierarchy. The president's mansion at the University of Alabama, for instance, was a special object of Jacksonian wrath it was, Democrats railed, a palace, a stupendous model of architectural display, altogether too large for the president. He could never occupy half its rooms. But the aggressive egalitarianism of the yeomanry, rooted as it was in the exchange and partnership of a barter economy, also had a fiercely exclusionary element especially as to race and sex. Anyone outside the citizen body, anyone whom the Jacksonians could not imagine as partners in community life, was excluded from this new understanding of equality by their physical marks of difference. Equality in this sense meant equal partnership, the interdependence of otherwise autonomous citizens. Life in the plantation areas of Alabama was very different. The economy rested upon market agriculture. Cash sales, not barter, were the ordinary mode of exchange, carrying with them contracts and interest-bearing loans. And values reflected this experience. Residents expected to remain and to see their communities develop. They sought social improvement, roads, schools, public libraries. They looked to towns and cities for the latest fashions. Liberty meant the possibility of upward mobility, the openness of society to individual self-improvement. And because the essence of a free society was the possibility of moving upwards in the social scale, therefore the naturalness of social hierarchy was assumed. This was a world seeking to emulate the most modern developments of Victorian progress. It placed its faith in individual enterprise and private initiative, but it saw government as well as an instrument of community development, whether in the form of social institutions such as schools or in the form of what were called at the time internal improvements, roads, canals, and railroads. One striking mark of the cultural difference between the yeoman and plantation sections was birth rates among white families. In the hill counties and the wiregrass, farm labor was supplied overwhelmingly by the farmer's children. These counties show average birth rates of eight to 10 per household. But in the plantation areas where farm labor generally was supplied by slaves, and where salaried employees were not uncommon, white birth rates averaged only two per household. This is a statistical representation of the cultural gulf separating the state's geographical regions. Daniel Pratt, one of antebellum Alabama's leading industrialists, had a clear sense of this gulf. As a factory owner and investor, he wrote U.S. Senator Dixon H. Lewis, I feel myself to be a permanent citizen of this state. 
Nearly all I have is here, and here I expect it to remain. Consequently, I do feel a deep interest in our state affairs. If the state's small farmer majority, he continued, were situated as I am, that is, so they could not pull up stakes at any time when they chose and be off, then they would act and manage very different from what they now do. The great evil in our state is that persons generally do not consider themselves settled and consequently do not take nor feel that interest in the future prosperity of our state they otherwise would. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that when the national two-party system took root in the state, the parties reflected these cultural divisions. The majority Democrats found their strength in the hills and the wiregrass, while the Whig minority received its most enthusiastic support in the plantation counties and in the towns. Indeed, the foundations upon which the party system was built stretched back to the state's beginnings, and the parties merely gave the existing social rivalries an institutional form. Alabama had entered the Union along with the Panic of 1819, and its initial decade of statehood was also a decade of depression. During the booming territorial period, forces associated with the Huntsville Bank had induced the territorial legislature to repeal all statutory limits on usury in an effort to attract credit to facilitate the purchase of land from the federal government. The result was enormous interest rates and, with the panic, defaults on a massive scale, a series of suits known as the big interest cases, and eventually the impeachment of the justices of the state Supreme Court when they ruled against the recovery of the interest payments. Out of this turmoil came Governor Israel Pickens' proposal for the Bank of Alabama. The Bank of Alabama was owned by the state, and its purpose was to eliminate private property and capitalist greed completely from the banking system. All banks, Governor Pickens told the legislature, must at this day be viewed as public state institutions rather than associations for private enterprise. Pickens's followers, the future Jacksonian Democrats, dreamed of a bank that would operate essentially as an interdependent barter community writ large, neighbors assisting neighbors in need. In such a situation, the desire for gain seemed out of place, if not immoral. From the outset, the proto-Whigs, and later the real Whigs, warned that unless investors had their own money at risk, the result would be a lax and mismanaged institution that made loans not with a careful eye to the prospect of being repaid, but simply out of a misplaced good-heartedness, or worse, out of corruption. Democrats were confident that legislative regulation would prevent any such errors, but in fact, the Whigs proved correct on every point. The bank, as an arm of the state, was in no position to deny loans to members of the legislature or their friends, or to friends of the gubernatorial administration. The legislature repealed all state taxes and ordered the bank to declare dividends sufficient to cover the state's expenditures. When the Panic of 1837 hit, the legislature forbade the bank to foreclose on any of the mortgages backing its loans. And at the same time, it ordered the bank to issue millions of dollars in bonds, which it was instructed to lend to debtors to allow them to meet their obligations to others. The result, as any objective observer could have predicted, was the collapse of the bank. At this point, the Democratic Party split. 
Older members remain loyal to Governor Pickens' vision of a publicly owned bank, but a, a more radical loco foco wing of the party now concluded that all banks, whether public or private, were inherently vicious. In the legislature, an odd coalition of loco foco Democrats who were opposed to banking altogether and Whigs who had always been opposed to a state-owned bank joined together to abolish the Bank of Alabama. And in the gubernatorial election of 1845, the same peculiar coalition came together again to elect the loco foco candidate Joshua Lanier Martin over the pro-bank Democrat Nathaniel Terry. In the meantime, legislative Democrats reunited to reinstitute a tax system that was aggressively hostile to the wealthy. The bulk of state taxes came from the tax on slaves, paid overwhelmingly by planters. Most of the rest of the revenue came from taxes on capital and investments and taxes on luxuries, such as carriages, silver services, manufactured furniture, and gold watches. For the rest of the 1840s, from 1842 to 1851, Alabama had no banks at all, except for the small and shaky Bank of Mobile, whose charter the legislature could not constitutionally repeal. The questions surrounding the bank and similar disputes reflecting the state's regional economic divisions dominated antebellum politics. Also controversial were social issues, such as the creation of a public school system and the imposition of state prohibition of alcoholic beverages, both of which Whigs favored as progressive reforms and Democrats generally opposed as governmental interference with individual liberty. Democrats also sought the apportionment of congressional districts based solely on white population, the basis already used in apportioning state legislative districts under the state constitution. The adoption of the white basis for congressional districting had the effect, of course, of greatly increasing the power of the yeoman farmer sections of the state at the expense of the plantation regions. All of these socioeconomic issues had the force they did in antebellum Alabama politics because they expressed in symbolic form the socioeconomic differences dividing the state's geographical regions. But you may perhaps have noticed the absence from this list of the most obvious symbol of these regional differences, the institution of slavery. Whites in antebellum Alabama thought of slavery in much the same way that they thought of the family. As a social institution so commonplace, so much an assumption of everyday experience, that envisioning a world without it defeated the practical imagination. The abolition of slavery seemed not merely threatening, but more than that, absurdly utopian, rather like the elimination of any distinction between the sexes or between parents and children. Nevertheless, this is not to say that the parties did not differ in their conception of slavery. They did. Whigs thought of slavery as another of the many happy American institutions that facilitated upward social mobility. Slave labor permitted the practice of agriculture on an industrial scale and therefore permitted the accumulation of fortunes in the agricultural sector, something that in the non-slave states was possible only through manufacturing and commerce. Profit margins in agriculture were simply too narrow, unlike industry, to permit a large-scale wage labor force on a farm. Beyond one or two hired hands, the income from agriculture was insufficient to pay any substantial number of salaried workers. Slavery remedied this difficulty, as Whig saw it, 
and allowed uniquely the accumulation of investment capital in agricultural states on the same scale as in the manufacturing states. Democrats, on the other hand, thought of slavery as an institution that protected the mass of yeoman farmers from being compelled to become a labor force working for the wealthy. In the North and in Britain, Democrats argued, the market economy had ineluctably converted the mass of poorer whites into a proletariat, deprived of the capacity to shape their own lives. But the presence of slavery in the South meant that the labor force necessary in a market economy was supplied by persons outside the citizen body, indeed incapable physically of citizenship. The result was that the poor citizens in the South, uniquely in the Western world, had been able to retain their autonomy, to acknowledge no other man as master. This was the essential requirement for the successful functioning of democracy, and slavery was therefore vital to preserve democracy and the achievement of the American Revolution. It was as if the market economy were an electric current flowing through a live wire. It would inevitably kill anyone who touched it, but slavery was the insulation wrapped around the wire. Where there was slavery, the market economy could coexist with liberty and democracy, but without slavery, liberty and democracy would inevitably die out because the mass of the citizenry would inevitably fall into the power of a wealthy ruling class. Now it is clear that democratic theorists were exaggerating the role of slavery in preserving yeoman autonomy and emphasizing insufficiently the role of the public domain which was essential to the livestock economy. But it is also true that with the abolition of slavery and the engrossment of the public lands after the Civil War, the white yeomanry did indeed begin to lose their independence and descended into tenant farming held in persistent peonage by the crop lien system. And so there was more to democratic warnings than may at first appear. But in understanding the antebellum party system, the essential difference is this. Both parties embraced slavery, and hence slavery was not at issue in state politics. When slavery did get political discussion, it was only in campaigns for national office, and then Whigs and Democrats merely sought to outdo each other in affirming their determination to defend Southern interests from radical northern attacks. But though both parties were pro-slavery, the Whig case was pro-slavery and pro-planter, while the Democratic case was pro-slavery but anti-planter. That is, in the Whig conception of slavery, the planter was a social hero building capital with which the society could develop its potential and embrace the progress of the Victorian age. But the Democrats' conception of slavery, but in the Democrats' conception of slavery, the planter was the villain, a grasping capitalist, who given half a chance would proletarianize the mass of the citizenry, convert poor whites into, into a toiling working class, and convert themselves into a wealthy aristocracy. It was against the background of these hopes and fears that Alabama entered the booming 1850s. With the Mexican War and the discovery of gold in California, prosperity finally returned to the United States, and the country entered a dozen years of previously unequaled good times. The thriving economy generated changes in Alabama's public policy that deeply frightened 
residents for whom modernity represented principally the decline of individual autonomy and the rise of a hierarchy of wealth. The collapse of the Whig Party at the national level in 1854-55 facilitated these state-level changes because it meant that modernizer Democrats, the so-called Young Americans, could vote for programs which had previously been associated with the Whigs without seeming to be traitors to their own party, the Democrats. And so in 1854, the legislature at last established a state public school system and placed its funding on a sound basis in 1856. <laughs> public schools were soon followed by the creation of the State School for the Deaf and Blind at Talladega and the State Hospital for the Insane at Tuscaloosa. A central issue of politics in the 1850s was state aid for railroad construction, something which the legislature finally enacted over bitter opposition at the end of the decade. Even without state aid, though with considerable assistance from federal land grants, railroad construction advanced rapidly. At the beginning of this period, Alabama had only 76 miles of railroads built during the years of prosperity just before the Panic of 1837. By 1860, Alabama's track mileage had expanded to more than 730. As railroads built into the hills and the wiregrass, the cultivation of cotton for the market, previously inhibited by the lack of navigable rivers, began to expand with them. Industrial production also grew by 1860, Alabama had 14 textile mills with a production of more than a million dollars a year, for instance. And the legislature slowly recreated a banking system, this time as privately owned stockholder banks. By 1860, the state had eight banks with more than $13 million in loans outstanding. In response to increasing tax receipts and expanding governmental programs, state expenditures exploded upwards. In 1847, the state government was spending about what it had been spending in 1827. By 1860, expenditures were 15 times what they had been only a dozen years earlier and expenditures by counties and towns grew just as rapidly. Such statistics uh, could be multiplied, but I am sure the point is already clear. In the brief period uh, of a dozen years between the Mexican War and the Civil War, Alabama experienced a social and economic transformation which had profound political implications. And its principal implication, of course, was secession. As I have just said, in the mid-1850s, the principal issue in Alabama politics was state aid to railroad construction. Under the leadership of Governor John A. Winston, old Jacksonians strenuously resisted the efforts of young America Democrats and former Whigs to enact such assistance. A result of this struggle was to threaten to make the young Americans appear to be insensitive to the values of yeoman farmers. It was the search of these younger, ambitious Democratic politicians for an issue that would emphasize their sympathy with the yeomanry that led them to embrace the leadership of William Lowndes Yancey and his demands for federal protection of slave property in the Western territories. This crusade was ideal for the young Americans' purposes. The Democratic Party had always been deeply committed to westward expansion, stretching all the way back to Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase, on through Jackson and Indian removal, and up to Polk and the Mexican War. The heated congressional debates over the Wilmot Proviso and then the Kansas-Nebraska Act had led to the rise of the Free Soiler Republican Party in the northern states, 
dedicated to barring slavery entirely from the territories. Because Democrats in the Lower South had long stressed both the availability of undeveloped public land as essential to yeoman autonomy and the power of slavery to protect poor whites from becoming a working class for the wealthy, Republican demands for free soil in the West seem profoundly threatening and profoundly discriminatory. The territories were the common property of all American citizens, the Yanceyites raged, but the Republicans sought to brand Southern life as un-American, to bar Southern property from the West, to claim the territories exclusively for Northerners. With this case, the young Yanceyite politicians demonstrated their concern for the liberties of small farmers and their commitment to defend the equal rights of their region. This was the essence of the motto that they adopted as the nation moved towards the crisis of secession, equality in the Union or independence out of it. I have always thought that the most instructive statistic about Alabama's secession convention is this. A majority of those delegates engaged in agriculture were opposed to immediate secession. And so were a majority of those delegates who were neither farmers nor lawyers. But lawyer delegates favored immediate secession by two to one. What this circumstance reflects is the presence of so many ambitious young attorneys among the Yanceyites who were seeking to use the question of the extension of slavery into the territories as a way to counter Governor Winston's anti-railroad cr crusade and to cast themselves as defenders of the yeomanry despite their enthusiasm for the modernizing changes that were sweeping through the state's economy and society in the 1850s. It must seem odd to Americans today to associate an insistence on the extension of black slavery into the Western territories with a defense of liberty and equality. But it is perhaps no more odd than the association of a public school system with an attack on equality or of end-end removal with the extension of yeoman liberties. That is, what is odd to us today is not the values and policies that flowed from the world of the yeoman farmers so much as it is that world itself. Our own society is so much one that reflects the urban ethic of material progress and upward mobility, allied in the antebellum era with the Whigs, that recapturing the mental and emotional assumptions of people whose lives were rooted in a barter economy, subsistence agriculture, and reciprocal communities can only be an act of heroic historical imagination. But in antebellum Alabama, that struggle was still being fought. And it is that struggle precisely that defined both its achievements and in the end, it's self-destruction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thornton. At this time, we will take questions from the audience. Please remember that we would like for you to speak into the microphone. If you'll raise your hand when you have a question, I will get the microphone to you and then hold it directly in front of your mouth so that you can speak into it. Also, inside your program, there is an evaluation form. Please uh, complete the evaluation form and return it to our volunteers at the doors. This program is made possible through a grant from the Alabama Humanities Foundation, and we need to provide the evaluation evaluations in return to them. Do we have a question for Dr. Thornton? Raise your hand. Do you feel history is important in understanding the problems of today? Thank you. Um, 
Well, you know, the, the easy answer would, uh, would be yes, because I'm a historian and that's how I make my living. <laughs> But uh, I actually have a little more complicated uh, answer than that. Uh, attempting to understand the problems of today uh, through history often distorts the past. The, it, it leads to presentism. It leads to uh, failing to put yourself uh, into the mind of, of people who lived in the past. Uh, and the, the essence of, of, of good history um, uh, is being able to look out at the world through the eyes of people who lived in that age, to think about it uh, in the way they thought about it. Um, so talking about uh, history too much in, in, in terms of current issues makes, those, makes the world of those people too familiar. Uh, and, uh, and, and the work of a good historian is, is, is to defamiliarize the past, uh, to make it seem uh, um, as different as it is. It is a different country, and, uh, uh, and, it is, and you are encountering uh, uh, as much cultural difference by proceeding backwards in the past as you would be geographically today by uh, proceeding uh, to uh, Asia or Africa or, uh, or Latin America. So uh, I often tell my uh, students that uh, the answer to all important questions in history is yes and no. And uh, <laughs> the answer to that question is yes and no. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, okay. Mills, are there any parallels in the debates about the Alabama uh, State Bank and the national banks? Um, well, um, sure, there, there are. For the reason I just said, uh, I worry about drawing those parallels uh, uh, too closely. Um, but uh, back of, um, about a... a a couple of months ago when there was so much talk about the nationalization of our banks as the path out of our, uh, uh, out of our uh, economic difficulties, I often thought that the people who were talking about the nationalization of the banks obviously knew very little about the Bank of Alabama and the, <laughs> the history of the Bank of Alabama. Uh, uh, it, it's... Um, uh, I guess the, 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 uh, the principal difference uh, uh, for our modern, our, our current uh, uh, difficulties is that uh, what the Whigs warned about a publicly owned bank was that unless your own, uh, your own material uh, uh, interests were at stake, uh, you were going to make loans willy-nilly. Uh, and of course, we, we ended up because of uh, credit default swaps and uh, uh, and uh, all of those uh, things with, uh, with banks that were privately owned but that made loans willy-nilly anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, certainly, though, uh, the, the, answer is, uh, uh, the answer is that, that, that America, after the panic, uh, uh, well, America in the Jacksonian period, before the Panic of 1837, during the Bank War of Jackson's administration, and then after the Panic of 1837 with the rise of the Loco Focos, uh, America was undergoing the same sort of emotional uh, uh, attempt to understand uh, the interaction between democracy uh, and, uh, and, and a free economy uh, that, uh, that very suddenly and unexpectedly we've been plunged back into uh, just, I think, uh, in, in the last year. I would say that. Hi, Mills. Hi. How are you? I've always been curious about the 13 counties. There are special representatives to the secession meeting here in Montgomery, um, mainly from North Alabama, east of Cherokee, all the way over to west, I think, Franklin County, Colbert, that they voted against the ordinance of secession. And I've always wondered what was uh, their reasoning? Well, I, I, I tried to explain that, but let me, let, let me try a little more. Um, 
one of the one of the thing, one of the principal misunderstandings about uh, Alabama history proceeds precisely from that division at the Secession Convention. If you look at a map, the entire northern half of the state uh, votes cooperationist, that is, against immediate secession, and the entire southern half of the state votes for uh, immediate secession. So the, the line of division is precisely across the middle of the state. Uh, and groups all of northern Alabama on one side and all of southern Alabama on the other side. Well, it's very easy to, uh, uh, to, to, talk, to say in a, in, a, in a sort of uh, quick way that's a division between, uh, uh, between small farmer counties and plantation counties. But actually, that's not the case. What actually happened there is something much more peculiar. Uh, the hill counties, uh, uh, the Yeoman Farmer Hill counties, and the Plantation Tennessee Valley vote together in a block, and the Plantation Black Belt and the Small Farmer Wiregrass vote together in a block. So it's not a division between uh, small farmers and, uh, and planters, though it's often said that way. It's clearly a division strictly in geographical terms between the, north, uh, the northern part of the state and the southern part of the state. So how do you explain it? Well, I think the answer is that, um, uh, or let me state it, uh, let, let me backtrack and, and, and say, it, say it slightly differently. In 1850, in the crisis of 1850, um, the Whig, uh, the Whigs, in Alabama united with the Hill County Jacksonians to defeat the secessionists completely. The Southern Rights Party in, in the election of 1851 is simply smashed uh, by, this Whig, by this planter Whig, small farmer Jacksonian uh, coalition. In 1860, the numbers would have still been there, but uh, something else had intervened. You have to explain it on both sides. For the Whigs, we know what happened. It's the collapse of the Whig party at the national level, the failure of the know-nothings, and uh, the sort of desperate search on the part of, uh, of Whigs for something that can allow them to survive uh, which leads them to form what they call the Southern Rights Opposition. And they maneuver themselves, therefore, into a position in which in the secession crisis, uh, they, they really can't uh, oppose, or they split. Uh, a portion of them voted for John Bell in the, in the presidential election of 1860, but a lot of them uh, ended up uh, voting for John C. Breckinridge. And among the Democrats, things are more complicated. Among the Democrats, the division really, the, the division of the secession convention is really a battle for the soul of the Democratic Party between the new rising Yanceyite element and uh, the, uh, the elements equal in power within the Democratic Party led by Senator Benjamin Fitzpatrick and former Governor uh, John A. Winston. The Fitzpatrick and Winston forces are the cooperationists, and they adopted cooperationism as a tactic to uh, convince the voters uh, that they were solidly on the side of the yeomanry, but uh, were opposed to immediate secession as, uh, uh, as an ill-considered um, as an ill-considered policy uh, matter. Cooperationism, I should just say, what cooperationism said was that Alabama should not secede from the Union immediately and by itself because it might find itself out of the Union all alone. It needed to wait and see what else happened and uh, to cooperate together with all of the other southern states to present their uh, to, to to present a united front of resistance that's cooperationism
So the answer to your question, Gwen, wherever you <laughs> went, is, uh, uh, it is a more complicated uh, uh, one. The, the, the fact that the northern Alabama counties vote against immediate secession should not be taken as the same thing as uh, their, uh, as their um, uh, opposing secession under any circumstances. It is rather a, a political division within the state it's about the struggle within the Democratic Party for leadership within the Democratic Party, principally between Benjamin Fitzpatrick and William Lowndes Jansen. We have time for one more question. Given your warnings about presentism, would it be fair to trace any contemporary regional political attitudes to the period that you're describing? Yeah, the, yeah, y yes. <laughs> yes, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, regional divisions within Alabama have been uh, uh, a continuing theme throughout, uh, throughout Alabama history. It changes as time goes on. Um, in the 19th century, the Black Belt is the uh, is the richest and wealthiest uh, region of the state uh, all the way into the uh, end of the first half of the 20th century, all the way up to World War II. The Black Belt counties have the, uh, spend the most on their public schools. They, uh, they have the longest school term. Um, uh, all of this, uh, uh, all of the things you associate with, uh, with prosperity uh, are associated with the, w w with the Black Belt. I, I should say uh, they, the Black Belt counties are spending the most on their public schools, but, but, but they do that by, of course, spending virtually nothing on the black public schools. Uh, there are very few white uh, children, and they spend all of that money on the white public, sco on the white public schools, uh, and thus those white public schools are very, very good indeed. Um, today, the Black Belt is the most poverty-stricken uh, uh, region of the state, so much so that, as you know, we even have a, a special Black Belt task force trying to remedy the problems of poverty in the, uh, in the Black Belt, something that as recently as, say, 1920 uh, uh, would have astonished Alabamians. They would have wanted to remedy the problem of poverty in the Hill Counties. Um, uh, so, uh, so there are a lot of re changes in the, in the status of the regions, but the regional divisions persist uh, uh, in Alabama because they're rooted in history. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, history makes the, makes the present. Thank you, Dr. Thornton. If you have questions, Dr. Thornton will be here just for a few minutes if you would like to come up and speak to him. Thank you so much for coming today.